I have a new piece out on Substack. It's called The Birth of Art and Death. Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, and the Lichtung of the Human Mind. And that word Lichtung I've taken from Heidegger, where he uses it to refer to what he calls the clearing. And it means a glade in a forest when you come to an, an area that's open. So it's a noun, but I'm using it here simultaneously as a noun and as a verb. Lichtung in the sense of light, the lighting up of the human mind in both cases. The old model of the creative explosion occurring with art being invented by Homo sapiens is now gone. Um, new art has been found in 2018 in three caves in Spain, La Pasiega, El Castillo, and another one uh, that exhibit cave art that is uh, goes all the way back to 64,000 BC. And so the only hominids, the only humans that were in Europe at that time were Neanderthals. So cave art now begins with Neanderthals. They can no longer be regarded as lunkheads. Those days are just over. Uh, the Neanderthals were just as human as, as we. Um, it was the out-of-Africa migration theory that suggested that, and I'll go into it, I go into it in this essay, uh, the idea that modern Homo sapiens originated out of Africa around 160,000 years ago and then migrated up through Palestine and eventually across into Europe where they encountered the Neanderthals and replaced them. That's the polite word used. They actually committed genocide and completely wiped them out of existence. Except that when that process takes place, it's a very common one in history, when a new coming, incoming population uh, decimates another population, such as has was happened with, with the Mayans and the Aztecs, with the Spaniards coming in, or in the case of uh, America, in the North America with uh, the Native Americans being genocidally wiped out by the incoming whites. The normal process is to rape the women. You, you kill off the men and you rape the women. And that is exactly what has happened here with Neanderthals and modern Homo sapiens. Uh, most paleoanthropologists just don't have the balls to, to, to say that. It's clear that that's what happened. And there are genetic intermixing. There is a, the child found at Lagar Velo in Portugal, 24,000 uh, BC, who is uh, half half Homo sapien and half Neanderthal. So that hypothesis uh, this is nonsense. Uh, there was genetic interbreeding and genetic intermixing. We do have Neanderthal genes. There's an occipital bun at the back of the skull that we have that modern Homo sapiens in Africa before they migrated did not have a certain dental nerve. Eric Trinkhaus at uh, University of New Mexico is the expert on this. Um, so let me read you the first couple of paragraphs here. This is actually from a larger work that I wrote. Now, this chapter I wrote 30 years ago and never published it. The, the whole manuscript was never published, uh, The Wonder Child versus the Elders. So this is from the first chapter. I've already posted on here the introduction uh, to the book. And um, I, I, so this material I wrote 30 years ago, the only alterations I've made is putting in material about the finding uh, in 2018 of the new uh, cave art, the Neanderthal cave art. Uh, but the portrait that I paint of Neanderthals in here was always sympathetic to them and always uh, regarded them as fundamentally human and who buried their dead, worshipped cave bears, and absolutely had a religious mentality. There is no question about that. That isn't even up for debate. Um, idiots like David Lewis M Williams in The Mind uh, the mind of the Cave, or The Mind in, in the Cave, uh, says that Neanderthals were congenital atheists who could not possibly have conceived of their dead going to uh, another world. That's just dead, flat, fucking wrong. That never, that never That's not the case at all. Uh, Lewis Williams is a racist, as is Ian Tattersall, who in The Last Neanderthal says basically the same thing. Those guys are gone. Those, those old fogies and their racist paradigms, we, we don't need that anymore, it's, it's, so it's gone. It's, it's a different picture now. We're finding out more and more things about the Neanderthals such as that they uh, used tattoos on their bodies made out of black manganese and red ochre, that they wore necklaces made out of eagle talons and sea seashells as well, and uh, they created the first flute, so they had musical instruments. So, the, yeah, the old theory of them just being subhumans is, is wrong. It's, it's gone. It's, and the finding of cave art has put the, the final hammer blow to that ridiculous paradigm, that racist nonsense. These people were just as human as you, as you or me. I guarantee you that. Um, so here's the first couple of paragraphs. Blood and Bone. The archetypal mystery narrative from, <clears throat> from Poe's Dupont stories to the novels of Henning Mankell 
begins with the presence of a dead body. The hero detective then sets his mind to work on reconstructing the chain of causes that led to its existence as a way of recapitulating the scientific method, with its tracking of the roots of motion by piecing together slices of linear temporality. Western science began, of course, as a means of studying and analyzing dead bodies. Think of Rembrandt's anatomy lesson. For both planets and corpses have in common the fact that they are moved by forces external to themselves. During the scientific revolution, the universe was imagined as being covered with an invisible grid, and the natural philosopher tracing the arc of a planet's motion via the infinitesimal calculus was analogous to the forensics ex expert using a ballistics chart to diagram the path of a bullet. Christianity, too, is a religion that began with a meditation upon the dead body of Christ as it was brought down from the cross and carefully laid into its cavern sarcophagus from whence the disciples would come to marvel at its absence. Arnold Birkeland's 1867 painting Mary Magdalene lamenting over the dead body of Christ captures this moment with his vivid depiction of Christ laid out on a slab for viewing like a body at a coroner's office. Buddhism, too, originated with the sight of a corpse, for when the Buddha saw the body of a dead man set out in its yellow shroud for burial, he was moved to create a new religion. Death, it seems, is the inspiration for the awakening of all higher human thought. It is the great mystery of existence, and all culture, whether scientific or religious, is born of the attempt to fathom its implications. So I would like to begin, I would like to begin my narrative, too, with the apprehension of the mystery of death, in this case, the oldest known ritual burial, which was found in a cave at Kafsa, Israel, and dates back to about 100,000 years ago. Somewhere between 15 and 21 individuals were found buried in and around this cave, but the best preserved of them is known to archaeologists only as Q9, apparently the body of a woman with a child buried at her feet. There was little in the way of grave gear found in this burial, but the bones of both woman and child were stained with a light pink mist, the color of iron oxide, better known as red ochre. This is the earliest known use of red ochre in a burial, and its presence in the grave of this modern Homo sapiens woman attests already to the existence of symbolic thought amongst these early hominids. Now, red ochre is a trait that becomes characteristic of Homo sapiens burials, for Neanderthals generally did not use it for their burials, except in one or two isolated instances. Although most scholars have pretended that they have no idea what red ochre represents, the best explanation I've yet come across is from William Irwin Thompson, who thinks that it symbolized menstrual blood. For according to Aristotelian science, it was thought that the reason women stopped menstruating when pregnant was because the female body was using that blood to fashion the developing embryo. In the context of burial rites, then, covering the body with a shroud of red ochre was a way, was a way of ensuring that the magically effective power of the menstrual blood would reanimate the bones to create a new body. Thus, death meets its end at life's beginning. All right, I'll leave it there because I want you to subscribe. It's only $5 a month. Uh, to subscribe to my Substack or $75 a year if you just want to get a, a whole year subscription. I will be publishing chapters from uh, both this book and the novel that I'm working on back and forth all through the, the next few years. So you'll get your money's worth. I can guarantee you that. All right. Uh, we'll see you on Substack.